Well, welcome everybody to the next episode of our new series, VIP Visits. And today's VIP, I'm very excited to be talking with uh, a good friend and um, a marvelous Disney historian in his own right, uh, Peter Whitehead, the creative director of the Walt Disney Hometown Museum. Peter, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. What a pleasure. <laughs> well, the pleasure is all mine. And I think everybody's going to be very fascinated to hear some of your stories and stories of the museum, especially people who may not even know about the museum or, or even Marceline, Missouri at all. A lot of Disney fans are not even that acquainted with the life of the man, Walt Disney. So... I thought maybe we would start, even before we start with you, <laughs> uh, if you could let everybody who might not know, uh, know what Marceline is and where it is and why it's important. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as uh, everybody on this channel should know, Walt was born in Chicago in 1901. Uh, the family was running into some issues. Their parents wanted their kids uh, to be in a smaller community where they could keep their eyes on them. I, I've heard all sorts of stories about what that really is, what really happened in Chicago, and I'm not sure what it is, but it involved the older boys, Herbert and Raymond. So Flora and, um, and Elias decided that they were going to start a hunt for a small community to bring their kids up in. It was Elias's brother, uh, Robert, who actually suggested Marceline because he had purchased some property in the area. And they came out, fell in love, moved to Marceline in 1906. So I think the importance of Marceline to Walt is that, and, and we will get to it more as we, just, we chat today for sure, but it is the only time he just got to be uh, a child at, at heart, uh, at play. He had the run of uh, Marceline as a city. It was not a large community. It's still obviously not a large community. But going from Chicago to Marceline, it just opened the door to so many firsts for Walt. So uh, first time you ever saw a, a movie, first time you saw a live stage play, uh, first time you went to school. There's just so many firsts. And of course, Walt reflected back on that time. And even if it wasn't quite as magical as it might have been in reality, I think much like Walt did with a lot of things, I think he might have just inflated just how massively important that community was to his upbringing, because there's there's hugs to Marceline in, in almost every Disney park. Uh, as you would know, you, you can't be a cast member and not take traditions when you join the company. And part of your traditions course is to talk about Walt's history. And of course, you know, M Marceline is part of Walt's DNA. So it, it is, in fact, part of the fabric of the company, I think. That's a great point. And I think all of us tend to look back on our childhoods, especially if there was happiness there, or maybe part of it was happy, that has sees it through a haze of nostalgia. But um, who, who better than Walt Disney is going to do something like that? That's so much a part of his storytelling. Absolutely. And he was not ashamed of that. He, he loved nostalgia and loved telling, you know, sort of idealized stories, you almost want, might say, or romanticized but still, I mean, it, it, there's an idyllicness to the Marceline experience for Walt. I mean, he literally lived on a farm. He was exactly the right age where he didn't have to have too many responsibilities because he couldn't, he wasn't big enough to do a lot of the, the big chores. I'm sure this is where he also discovered his love for animals because how many animals had he encountered, you know, besides, say, pets or like dogs? Yeah. Uh, so there was also that. So um, I, I also find Marceline, I've, I've been lucky enough to visit there multiple times. I've, I've literally lost count. <laughs> yeah. And it's just it's just a lovely place. I'm a small town boy myself, so I do like small towns. And the people there are wonderful. And I find it... I find it just a beautiful community. So in the midst of this community now, and and I believe you're celebrating your 20th anniversary or the museum's 20th anniversary, I should say, there's yeah. this beautiful, little known, I think, unfortunately, uh, museum called the Walt Disney Hometown Museum. And maybe you can let people know what 
what that is, basically. Yeah, absolutely. It's um, it's an interesting story how this museum came about. Uh, it, it, we only exist because of Walt's sister, Ruth. So if you talk about that family growing up in Marceline, Walt, Roy, uh, Ruth, for sure spent obviously the most time in Marceline. The two oldest boys were there for a year. Uh, it was not for them, and they went off to Kansas City. So the heart tie to that city uh, is in those three. It's Walt, Roy, and Ruth. And Ruth, uh, before she passed away, had started to put pieces aside uh, to donate to the city to make sure that their family story was was told there because she knew the importance of it uh, to her and to her brothers. So we exist in this beautifully restored 1913 Santa Fe Railway Station, and we have about 4,000 artifacts. Uh, I, essentially, what I tell people when they come to see us is they're they're going to be exploring uh, Ruth Disney's personal collection uh, interspersed with some story stations. So we are lucky enough to have people that work uh, and donate their time in our museum that knew Walt, that had met Walt, have personal stories to share about Walt. So uh, before those stories are lost to time, that's one of the things that we focused on in the last few years is to make sure that that their stories were told forever. So uh, in, in a very nice way, numerically, we have so many guests coming through the museum. There was a time uh, in the first 15 years of our life that you would come and get a personal tour of the first gallery by a docent, which is lovely. But uh, our docents also used to come to work and bring books because sometimes there wasn't a guest one day or there would be guests seldom enough that they would catch up on their reading. And it became so busy that um, all they were doing is a, a tour and then another tour. And for uh, our amazing docent team, it was it was a, a bit of a game changer uh, how increasingly busy that we've become over the last few years. So we've decided to address that so that we can still stay personal. Uh, like I want you or anybody to come to our museum and really feel like they're getting stories told that they've never heard before by somebody who are the, really the only people that could share those stories. It's amazing. And I was saying it's little known and in a sense it, it's, it still is, but based on what you're saying, the museum is more well-known than it used to be. I know, yeah. I know we've, we've been chatting a little bit uh, over the last few weeks and you've been telling me that the visitors, the, the number of visitors has really increased. And, yeah. And the, as you're saying, no time to be sitting around reading a book if you're a docent now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's changed and it's great. I, I will tell you the very first time I ever came to Marceline, I understood the importance of Marceline and Walt's life. That's why we went. So my my son, Christopher, had got a job at Disney. So he had finished university, wasn't sure what he wanted to do with his life. He applied, uh, because we're from Canada, he applied to get a job at Epcot and was uh, working at uh, Le Cellier, essentially, <laughs> and loved it. And he was there for a year. But as we were driving down, we were close enough to Marceline that he wanted to go and experience that city before he started his Disney um, time, his his one year in in Florida. So we did, and did not know there was a museum. <laughs> My and I'm a you know I'm a pretty big Disney fan, so I was kind of shocked that there was a museum. And when we walked through, I just fell in love. Uh, you know, my background is um, marketing and advertising. I did some documentary film work, so it's all about storytelling. Whether you're telling a 30-second story as a commercial, if you get to expand that story to do a documentary film and you're telling a story over an hour and a half or two hours, uh, all we're doing is telling stories, but in a very three-dimensional, uh, far more vivid way. And I know when Christopher and I walked through that museum for the very first time, for the next two days in the car, all we talked about was, oh, man, if we had the opportunity to do something in that museum, what would we do? Um, kind of laid out this course for the things that, as a Disney fan, I would love to see there. And a year and a half later, when my son and I were sitting upstairs in the, the upper gallery on Walt's uh, porch that we had talked about during our visit and looked at each other and thought, how is this happening? Why? <laughs> how am I here telling this story now and making the changes that we discussed? It's, it's pretty exciting as a Disney fan 
to be able to walk in and say, I would love to see this aspect of the story or that piece is hidden and we need to shine a different light on it to, to just bring out pieces that no one's ever heard of before. I, I think I think anybody who's a, a, a true, true Disney fan would love the opportunity to to um, to be here and tell these stories as well. And I'm sure you find a lot of people coming through that almost, well, I was going to say like you, you did have a background in, in, in Disney history, though. You knew who Walt Disney was and knew what Marceline was. But how many people come through and say, gosh, we we didn't even know this museum was here. We didn't know that Walt Disney had anything to do with this small town. I'm sure most people don't even know where he's from, period. They, they might know that the Disney studio is in Burbank, but even then. All that people tend to think of the parks, of course. Yeah. And, but where did that all come from? So it must be very exciting to see people discover not only the history of Walt Disney, but kind of this history of a bygone era. Uh, so, how, what kind of reactions do you get from from people that come in and don't know and don't know much about Walt's background? It's interesting, for sure. Um, I love, and it happened this morning. So when I showed up for work, there was a car waiting for the doors to open. And uh, they had just driven past the highway and saw a sign off the highway, did not know the importance of Marceline. They were Disney fans, but did not know um, why Marceline was important or what there would be uh, to see in the museum. And and they wandered through for an hour and a half and, uh, you know, ended up buying a brick and couldn't, uh, couldn't believe that this... Uh, this hidden gem is here. But I will tell you, that's the interesting thing about COVID as we're living through this really unique period in the in the global universe that nobody hopefully will have to live through again, although I suspect we will at some point. But um, the thing that I love is it, Disney people were still coming. So our museum is small enough that uh, we mandated a mask rule and, and we asked for social distancing and all those things. But we can um, we can be pretty vigilant in how many people we let in at any given time to give people the comfort level that they can explore the museum and not be surrounded by other people. So um, that fell into place really lovely. But the people who didn't know the Disney story, uh, it's it's amazing when they come through the you know through the museum uh, to exit because uh, it's such an important piece of Walt's history that I just assume everyone knows it, but. <laughs> If you're local, it's just bringing out, um, for the first year at the very end of 2020 when we reopened, uh, the greeting that I had for people uh, was, um, are, are you here because you're a Disney fan or are you just happy to get out of the house? <laughs> right. and, and, and we're getting more and more people who live in the area who might have known there was a museum here or it's been on their bucket list. And because Disney was not as accessible as it was once, um, of, of course, Disneyland just reopening. Yeah. Uh, Disney World has been open for a while now, but still because of the limited numbers. And I think people's just uneasiness of potentially going and being surrounded by a very large group of people uh, opened the doors to us in a really incredibly unique way because people were coming to Marceline as to get their Disney fix, essentially. Um, so our attendance numbers didn't really falter during a uh, global pandemic, which is a testament, you know, to the museum for sure, but for the power of Walt himself, it's that name is, <laughs> is known across the globe as we all know. I mean, we're all, we're not saying anything unique, but it's shocking to me how many people know the name Walt Disney, but don't know any of his history. That's right. Of course, sometimes you there are people that don't even know he's a real person. So True. <laughs> how much more so than that? They, uh, it's amazing that they discover who he was as a child and what all that meant. And I think people definitely may start making the connections immediately. Uh, Main Street USA uh, or some version thereof at the, at the various parks, you see it right away. You, yeah, you, I, it's it's just incredible. And you said something that resonated with me because you were so kind to join us at our virtual gala last year and do a presentation. And you said a line to me that I hadn't really thought about 
but it resonated with me and I stole it and I use it often now in my presentations. <laughs> but when you go to Disneyland or Disney World, as you said to me, you can decide not to go to Tomorrowland or you can not go to Adventureland or you can not go to Fantasyland, but you must travel down Main Street when you enter the park. So you are forced into experiencing <laughs> early 1900s America, Walt's favorite time. You have to experience it before you go anywhere else. And, and I never really thought about it until you brought it up. And it it struck a chord with me that, 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 that how important is this community that Walt kind of forced you to experience it. Yeah, and it's so deliberate that he must have... I mean, it, it's just... It's just, I don't want to say obvious because it's not obvious, but it's when you look at it, it's obvious that it's designed that way. Uh, and you re I really would like to ask him a lot of questions, but I would like to ask him about that if that was possible. What, yeah. why is that so important? Why? So it does, it is, I mean, going to the parks, going to Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom can be very intense. So uh, perhaps there just needs to be that moment of calm after your journey there and getting out yep. of the car and all that. Maybe, maybe he sensed this would give a feeling of calmness, at least sort of ease you into it. But we both know there's so much more to it than that. Yeah. And experiencing Marceline really gives you a clue. I, I think there's a lot of people that have never even really been to a small town. They've never been to the Midwest or experienced what, and it is a step back in time. Marceline, yeah. Marceline has not changed that much. Isn't that correct? It's still pretty much the same layout. I mean, there's not a huge amount of, you know, building up or tall buildings or huge businesses. It's still, still farmland. It's still the, the small town. Yeah. yeah, when we came, when Walt came back in '56 um, to celebrate our pool opening, that was the first time he came back to be celebrated. And all the photos of Walt on Main Street, if you were on Main Street today, you'd identify the same building. So Walt would be very comfortable in Marceline to this day. Uh, the interesting thing, and again, we'll we'll probably get to it at some point, but Walt was going to build. Uh, we we call it a theme park. It was it wasn't really going to be a theme park. It was going to be a working turn of the century farm, but uh, through his private company, Retlaw, he had acquired over 300 acres in Marceline to hold this park. And I can't imagine that he wouldn't have used uh, Midget Autopia as the tip of the iceberg in terms of trying to figure out the easiest way to take rides that uh, needed to retire from the bigger park and relocate them. Uh, and that's what happened with that amazing ride to Marceline. And I can't imagine he wouldn't have done more of that. I, I just can't fathom it wouldn't have had a train on it because <laughs> I, I just think Walt would have uh, just turned over if, if there wasn't a train <laughs> on his park in Marceline. So right. it, it, it really is amazing. Um, yeah, it's the similarities and, and the comfort level that Walt would have to this day is really only there because sadly Walt passed away in 66 and that park didn't move forward. So I think if it had, much like Disneyland when it was uh, Orange Groves and a very sleepy community in Southern California that became this destination um, spot with nothing, you know, there's no square footage that's not covered with something. I'm almost glad that that park didn't happen because people do have the opportunity to come to Marceline and experience it as a community that Walt would identify with. It's amazing. It's amazing. And part of that, you, you allude to it now, is uh, the whole idea of trains. And certainly Walt's love of trains, he may have had it before, but so maybe not born in Marceline, but uh, certainly grew. Uh, yeah. And Marceline being a I don't know what the word would be. You would know better than me. It's not a. It's not a hub, but it was a division point by the Santa Fe, linking um, Kansas City and Chicago. And so a lot of trains went went through there in Walt's day, and that continues today. <laughs> yeah, uh, not so much passenger trains. Uh, we we get a lot of freight trains, but 
uh, we get up to 70 trains to pass our museum every day. And, and the setback from the closest track is 15 feet. So you can't, you can't ignore them <laughs> when they come through. They are there. They are part of the experience. And we have signage that talks about how many trains that come through the community. And so people always see that when they first walk in and say, that can't be true until they leave. And, and they've lost count of how many trains have passed during their visit. So it is pretty cute. But I, I don't know uh, this for a fact. I mean, I, it is funny, and you just alluded to it. Uh, if I could pick one person on the face of the earth to, to bring back from the dead to have dinner with and have a chat, you know, everyone says, oh, it would be my parents. Um, it wouldn't be my parents because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to just see them for an hour and have to go through that heartbreak again of losing them. But Walt, I would uh, pay anything to have that experience because I am curious. I suspect the first time that he was ever on a train was when they came from Chicago to Marceline. But I don't know why he would have been on a train before that. It's not to say he wasn't, but uh, I suspect he was. Right. So, I, I agree with you. He may have experienced trains in, in some way and ridden, but, but that's, you know, that's quite a trip where you can, you're really experiencing what a, what a train journey is. Yeah. So that must've been the beginning of the magic for him. And then. Absolutely. And then Mike Martin. So of course his uncle was an engineer on the Santa Fe. And when he would come into town, uh, he would just sort of toot his whistle in a very specific pattern that if Walt, heard it, and if he could run to the tracks fast enough, uh, Mike would pick him up and they would go into the into Marceline downtown together and walk back to the Disney property from <laughs> from the train station. So it's uh, it's pretty, I think, safe to say that his his passion for trains really was born uh, during his time in Marceline. So what is a brief history of the building that the museum is in now? You uh, you already mentioned it, but I'm curious about what would, I mean, you know, decades between Walt's life there and when the museum opened. Sure. So that uh, the station is uh, built in 1913. It's a beautiful, uh, almost overly built building of concrete and brick. It replaced the wooden structure that was there when Marceline was formed in 1888. So our uh, 1913 Santa Fe Railway Station is the perfect home for our museum for many reasons, but more so just the fact that that railway station was abandoned for 10 years. So a train, an Amtrak train, hadn't stopped there physically in Marceline since the late 90s. Oh, wow. And so it was about uh, a decade where that, that station closed and was starting to get pretty run down. Uh, there was a group of uh, of local investors who decided to purchase that from the Santa Fe Railway and bring back uh, at least just the first gallery. So what we call the Marceline Gallery right now was the museum. That was the that was the museum, and we were only supposed to be open for three days to celebrate Walt's hundredth birthday. <laughs> so that again is the testament to the power of the name Walt Disney, because even though we were only to be open for a handful of days. Uh, people just kept coming and wanted to hear the story. So we stayed open and slowly took over more spaces. So it's almost 10,000 square feet in um, in total. It's all beautifully restored now. And if anything, we're uh, hoping and talking about how we build an extension to to further our story because it's, it's um, <laughs> you know, it, the museum has grown. So have our displays and uh, the people who've reached out to share stories within the museum. So suddenly, at one point, we had a museum to fill. Uh, our museum is full now, and so we, we want to continue to grow on that story. And it's amazing because I've seen some of the growth myself. I'm, I always try to remember what year I went the first time. It must have been about 2005, uh, because both my brother and his family live in St. Louis. And then uh, I had friends in another small town called Mexico, <laughs> yep. Mexico, Missouri. <laughs> and it was while visiting them that, that I said, well, gosh, I want to go to Marceline. And one of my friends said, why? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, come on, that's the whole, the, uh, another person that had no idea about any connection with Walt Disney. And I forget, I, mu I mean, I must have known about the museum 
because I probably looked it up and said, well, if we're going to go to, you know, Marceline, what's there? But I didn't, I know I did not know about Toonfest. And it was a complete coincidence, complete coincidence that I was there at exactly the time Toonfest was happening. Because I know we were in a grocery store and my friend was saying, this is my friend. He works for Disney and we're going to Marceline on Saturday. And the, the fellow at the grocery store said, oh, are you going to the Disney Festival? And we were like, what Disney Festival? <laughs> so how, I mean, how meant to be that was. That's that, funny. That is exactly the, the, the same time. So I guess that brings up, I had another question, but now that I brought up Toonfest, uh, what is Toonfest? And um, is that still happening? And I mean, I guess things have changed in the last year or two. <laughs> sure. Yeah, Toonfest uh, certainly didn't happen last year. Uh, not a lot of things happened, uh, sadly, last year. Right. Um, Toonfest was started before the museum actually opened, and it was uh, not so much a Disney celebration. It was um, it was tagged to be just an animation festival, so it was artists who would come. Uh, talk to the school groups about getting into that field, talk about their career, did the same thing essentially for adults. And then there was a dinner on the farm and a parade, uh, all that fun stuff. And so it ran for, I think, 25 years, I'm going to say, but I might be wrong. It could have yeah. been a little more, a little less, but it's been easily that long, I think. I think you're right. Uh, and then the group, as is often the case, uh, the group that worked on it were just getting tired of doing it. You know, when when you start out uh, young and energetic, and then 25 years later <laughs> you're doing the same project, it gets uh, it gets tiresome for sure. And so it, the and group it grew, it grew, it got bigger and bigger. It seems like every it did. year, so a bigger job. So two years ago, the museum or um, they decided that that would be the last year that they would hold Toonfest and. Ah. Uh, I personally thought it was too important to let it go. So it's being rebranded as a creativity festival. So it's not just artists who are coming. Uh, Mindy Johnson's going to be coming this year, for instance. She's obviously not an artist. She's an, an incredibly accomplished writer and Disney historian in her own right. Terry Harden is coming. So it's, again, interesting to hear an Imagineer's point of view. It's a very different perspective than just uh, an animator. Um, and then... Uh, uh, Joseph uh, Yakovetic is coming. So again, a true Disney artist. So we, we, we're, I like the idea of expanding what creativity can be. I don't want to just peg it to somebody who has incredible artistic talent. Right. Uh, a lot of people have talents in incredibly different ways. And I, and I want to inspire kids from small communities to think that just because they come from Marceline or Mexico or wherever they happen to be uh, on the planet, it shouldn't preclude them from dreaming big, you know, and that's certainly the case with Walt. It's so that's why I like bringing it back to Disney now because um, he is just such a great example of someone who could have gone in a million different directions with his life. Uh, he certainly was not pushed by Elias to be an artist. <laughs> <laughs> so <for> sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so he knew what he wanted to do and obviously became, um, you know, arguably, the most uh, well-known name on the planet besides his creation, Mickey Mouse. So uh, <laughs> it's pretty impressive. It's, it, it, I, I love that. I love when kids come to the museum in particular and you sit down and you chat about what they expected or what their dreams are, <laughs> what they want to do. I, I don't want for one second for a child to think that they're handicapped or handcuffed because of where they live or what they have to do. Um, you know, you don't have to have a computer to be an artist. Really, you have to have an imagination and a pencil and a piece of paper. That's all you need. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That, and Walt is certainly proof of that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, so I was starting, before bringing all, all that up with my little story, um, I was starting to get to the point that in visiting the museum uh, over the years, I've seen tremendous growth in the building itself and what's presented there. So maybe maybe you could let people know some of the, you know, some of the enhancements that have happened over the, over the more, you know, some of the more recent years. 
when I came to the museum for the first time, the thing that struck me is it was very labor intensive. <laughs> There's a lot of reading to do, uh, which is great. If Again, if you're a big Disney fan, you'll be there all day reading anyway. But for people who are not necessarily as passionate, um, it, it was a lot to ask of our of our uh, visitors to sit and just read, read, read. So we've created, as we brought up earlier, these story stations. So there's a, I think there's a love and now in the museum where you wander up and it used to be a push button start, but now it just plays all the time. And, and you get to hear a beautiful story about Walt's time in Marceline. And the thing that I love about every story that we tell in the museum, let alone the story stations, is they're always finished with Walt's own voice. So it roots our stories very deeply in fact. It's not something that we've created or made up. People come and say, why was Walt so passionate about this community? Well, wander through the museum and Walt will tell you himself why he was so passionate about this community. And that's what I love. So I, I love hearing Walt's voice personally. So I wanted to kind of inject that into our museum. Uh, the big change that we had, and it was again, only supposed to be temporary, was uh, our collector's gallery. And our collector's gallery, as it sounds, was the one opportunity it was uh, brought into the museum four years ago, and it was supposed to be for a single year where donors could show off their favorite Disney pieces alongside Ruth's pieces. Um, and now, four years in, it, it, we've created a bit of a monster. It's not going anywhere. It's uh, incredibly popular. I, I love that gallery space because there is not, for sure, maybe not a day goes by, but there's not a week that goes by where someone doesn't step into our museum and say, oh, I have this at home. I have this piece. And and it's not only the actual physical um, piece that might come into the museum, but it's the story behind it that I find fascinating. So it's why are you a collector? or How did that piece come into your collection? What sparked your love of Disney or Walt? Because it traditionally does flow back to Walt or Roy. It's not necessarily the park or just the movies or just the music. It It weirdly goes back to a person and it's Walt. So I love that people have a, an outlet to express their affection for this amazing human being in our museum now. Uh, so that's constantly growing. It's it's actually doubled in size since uh, it came into our museum four years ago oh, wow. and it includes some amazing pieces, some just stunning pieces that have come into collections. Um, the one that I love talking about are these little tiny Noma Christmas lights that are from the 30s, I believe. And the gentleman who gave them to us, he had actually passed away and his wife reached out and they had a, a house full of collectibles. And she said, you can take anything that you want to put in the museum. And as we were wandering through their house on his office desk in uh, there were these little tiny lights. And I said, well, and there's just the caps, just the plastic caps with the Disney characters on it. So I said, well, what's the history? And she said, well, the year he was born, his parents bought those lights and put them up on their Christmas tree. So every year, that was Christmas to him. So when his parents passed away, he took those lights, kept them in his personal collection. Uh, every time they moved, the first question was, where are my Christmas lights? I need to know where my Christmas lights are. Um, so, you know, the piece themselves, I wouldn't say they're mundane, but they're, they're not super elaborate. They're very intimate and small. But the story is so impactful behind them that I love that you can go and look at those pieces, but you can also read the story as to why that piece is here. So um, so that's a really important piece of our museum. Uh, you can literally sit in Ruth's room now, and uh, as behind you, the, the opening of Disneyland is playing, we play it as well. Uh, and the story behind it is uh, we have Ruth Disney's television that Walt purchased for her to watch the opening of Disneyland. Um, <laughs> Walt and Roy, of course, invited Ruth to attend, and she didn't like crowds, and she didn't want to travel, so she said no, which I still find amazing that she did that, but she did. And um, so Walt said, well, watch it on TV because it's going to be on television. And she said, I don't have a TV, so I won't be watching it, Walt. And Walt sent her money, and she purchased this a television. So our executive director, the very first time that she met with, uh, with Ruth's son, Teddy, found a receipt. And, and and he told the story based on the receipt. And she said, well, can I have that receipt? I can talk about the opening of Disneyland based on that little piece of paper. And he said, the TV is literally in the garage. You can have the TV. 
So uh, you can sit in our museum and watch exactly what you're watching uh, over your shoulder, the opening of Disneyland. And every commercial break is our executive director telling the story about how it was were, you know, acquired. The whole concept to me is, is just slow down. Let's, let's simplify our story, but let's make it deeper. Um, so there were temporary walls up when I sure showed up at the museum where you almost had to find the story. It was a wall of eight by tens and you just had to kind of look through <laughs> and try to figure out what story they were trying to tell you. And uh, I was lucky enough when I first got to the museum that I um, just gutted the second floor and started from scratch and, and picked a handful of really important stories and just told them in, in much deeper detail. Yeah, it's quite amazing because I think when I first went there, the second floor wasn't even accessible. It, yeah, probably it was, not. It was all on the first floor, and yeah. I've, I've seen that expand. It's it's just amazing. And you've met the challenge so well. I mean, I think every museum has, large or small, has the challenge of what is our story and how to tell it. But also you have to provide for a more casual view uh, visitor because every museum has those. Every, that yeah. like, oh, there's a museum, let's go in there. And they might just wander through and that's that. So, yeah. so to kind of reach those people and capture them, it, it, seems like, it seems like you're doing a fantastic job because I do think it's been my observation uh, based on what you've told me and many others have that everyone that comes through seems to be touched in some way even if they're not the, the biggest Disney fans or the, you know, the most knowledgeable or what have you, they really are touched by the story of Walt and Marceline. So it's pretty, it's quite an achievement, I think. Yeah. It's, well, it's lovely because as we continue to, uh, to grow and invite more and more guests, um, obviously the name Walt Disney um, is a direct link to family. So you're expecting family entertainment. And that's something that we, we're, we really didn't follow up on very well in the first 15 years of our life. So it was really important to me as families were starting to show up to give something for those kids to do in our museum. So there's all sorts of little areas where kids can sit down and either watch uh, The Spirit of Mickey, which is a, a cartoon that was released by the Disney company in, I think it was uh, the early 2000s. You know, you could sit down and watch that upstairs because that's a part of our story. I mean, the thing that's really important for me is to to always make sure that the focus is on a Marceline story. We're, we're not, don't come to the museum to hear about the history of Mickey because as much as I love Mickey, that is not our story. Um, but kids want to see Mickey. So in the collector's gallery, that allows that opportunity because most people's collectibles tend to revolve around Mickey. And so kids can walk in. We have a big seven foot Mickey in our collector's gallery that, I, you know, there's nothing nicer than when a child walks through that door. And I know that the second that they turn to the right, they're going to see a Mickey Mouse that is far taller than they are most times. <laughs> and, and that whole wow, that, that, oh my goodness, as they turn the corner, just makes me so happy. Um, yeah. It's just really important to, to make sure that the, the whole family's entertained. It's, it's paramount for us and to include the community. You know, that's the other thing that we had as an issue is people came to Marceline, enjoyed the museum, and then they left. So it was really important to get people to linger a little bit longer and walk down Main Street and they can go to the farm now and they can see where the Dreaming Tree was and go to the Disney barn and sign the inside of the barn. There's all sorts of opportunities to experience other Disney stories within the community but for our community to benefit as well. So the restaurants, the shops on Main Street, if, uh, if they're a, mu a museum partner, they'll get a discount or a free gift if they show their date stamp ticket. So it's, you know, you have to come in with, with eyes wide open and, and not only know how to benefit the museum, but I think it's only fair to benefit Marceline in general. And I've seen it even when I've been there. I've seen people come in that don't really know what it's all about and what's going on. And they get very excited and they really love staying and visiting, not just the museum, but the community itself. Absolutely. Two things have, are occurring to me. One is you've mentioned Ruth several times. Now, uh, Roy Disney, there's a chance that people have at least heard of him because, of course, he was Walt's, <laughs> not only his brother, but his business partner. Yeah. So 
almost as important, let's say, <laughs> as Walt Disney and building the Walt Disney Company. But maybe you could tell us who Ruth was uh, exactly and, and what was the relationship between her and, 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 and Walt, even as, even as adults. Yeah, it, it was incredibly strong. And again, we talk about, uh, when I do presentations, I talk about it as a sandwich. So I talk about as you just said, Walt and Roy being the meat of the sandwich. Everybody knows Walt and Roy, and the bread is Herbert and Raymond and Ruth, because not everybody knows about the rest of the family. And even though um, Herbert and Raymond were only in Marceline for a year, uh, and they don't have the same connection to Marceline, in terms of a family unit, they were still very tight as a group. So it wasn't like they were dismissive of their time in Marceline, because they obviously knew the importance. But uh, Ruth and Roy and Walter shared the most time in there. And it's interesting because we have all sorts of family letters from scrapbooks or just letters that Ruth um, gave to us to share. Uh, Walt and Roy financially supported Ruth, uh, not only when she got married and helped her buy a house when they first came, but every money or every month they sent a little bit of money, uh, every birthday, every Christmas. Um, there's just all sorts of letters. And sometimes they weren't even from Walt or Roy. It would just be from a secretary saying, here's your here's your monthly check. Hope everything's going well in Portland. And um, so they stayed incredibly connected, very, very tight as a family. And I would say um, when you look through the bulk of the letters, uh, I don't know if we have any in our collection from Ruth to Herbert or Raymond. Um, they're all to Walt and Roy. That's That is just the conversation. And I know that Ruth, well, obviously we celebrate a bunch of times that Walt came back and Roy came back to the community, but the same can certainly be said of, of Ruth. Um, when she, you know, she came back to Marceline often as well, obviously wasn't celebrated the way her brothers were, but she was, um, she knew friends in Marceline her whole life and she wanted to go back and visit often. And I still talk about even their parents, if you think about it, on their 50th anniversary, when Walt and Roy promised them a, a trip to anywhere in the world that they wanted to go, lo and behold, they wanted to go to Marceline. Oh so they visited Marceline. It's, <laughs> so, I, you know, I defy anybody who's, who, who questions the validity of Marceline as a really impactful part of Walt's life or the Disney's life. Um, the proof is in the pudding. Wow, that, those are amazing stories. I'm not sure I knew that Ruth visited Mar Marceline at all, let alone fairly frequently. So that's... And the, jo the joy of her visit is she came back, was visiting friends, asked a friend who was living in the Disney farm. So he said, I know who's living in the Disney farm, so I'll make that connection. And, it, and it, that goes back to when Walt was starting to acquire property for his Marceline project. Uh, he did it through a, uh, a gentleman by the name of Rush Johnson. Uh, they stayed with the Johnsons the very first time they came to Marceline. So from 56 to 66, they were incredibly close as, a, as two families could be. Uh, whenever the Disneys came to Marceline, they stayed with the Johnsons. Whenever the Johnsons went to California, they stayed with the Disneys. So they were very good friends. Uh, and he was also the, per the person purchasing property on behalf of Walt um, for this potential project in Marceline. So when it did not happen, uh, Roy had, uh, again, I'm saying this like you don't know this, but came out of retirement to finish Disney World, reached out to Rush and said, we're not going to get to Marceline. It's just not going to happen. So he had a first right of refusal to buy back whatever property he wanted to. He purchased the 40-acre farm to make sure it stayed intact. So um, their daughter, Kay, who is our executive director, was living in the house. So um, this gentleman brought Ruth over, introduced her to Kay, and of course they got off, um, you know, as best friends and started talking about the house. So the very last time that Kay got a full tour of the Disney house was from Ruth Disney. So that's why she knows her home so intimately. She, you know, there's, there's at the back in the, in the dining room, there's the back of the hearth that was for the kitchen. And Ruth used to talk about how when she got really sick, um, Flora would wrap her in a blanket and have her lean against the hearth because it would be the warmest part of the house to help her get uh, over her illness. That's why uh, Kay knows whose bedrooms were her because Ruth walked her through the house. It's it's incredible to have that provenance um, from a natural Disney family member to, to share those intimate, intimate stories that we can now share with everybody. But that's how that 
relationship started. That is really the um, the starting point of that friendship that became the donation of the gifts to Kay when Ruth passed away, and that started the museum. That that one beautiful little visit. Well, we're having such a great talk, Peter, that I thought maybe we would stop here and save the rest for part two. So would you be willing to stick around and have more of our conversation? I would love to. Oh, great. So everybody watching, uh, tune in next week for part two of my conversation with Peter Whitehead of the Walt Disney Hometown Museum.